Welcome to Wild Places. I'm your host, Brad Clement. This podcast is presented by Panji Foundation, saving snow leopards, helping communities. All right, Jason Atten, welcome to Wild Places podcast. Yeah, I don't know quite how to introduce you. Uh, you are a mountain guide. You're you're a fitness trainer. You you excel at long distance off trail uh, alpine running. Uh, you do so many things, and you do them in ways that really push the boundaries of what I think most people think is possible. And I and and at some point through this conversation, I really want to get into that 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 you do extraordinary adventures very quickly. And, and to me, that has always been really intriguing. But at, at the heart of the deal is, I know you to be one of the most humble, kind, polite people. You know, you, you don't have this ego, which could and maybe is often associated with the kind of activities you do. And you know, that's, that's what I love at the core of it. When did you, know, a lot of people maybe don't find wilderness exploration adventure until later in their life. Some people are lucky enough to, to find that early in life. When did that happen with you and your journey in life? Were, were you young? Were you older? How, how did you discover this kind of this quest and passion for adventure? Yeah, great question, Brad. Um, when I was very young, my sister and I would regularly play outside with, with our parents. Uh, I think every, every weekend, at least one of those weekend days, uh, my dad would take the both of us, whether it be bike riding, hiking, um, you know, pretty, pretty low, low risk, but uh, certainly outdoor centric, you know, fun filled, filled days. And uh, so it started at a, at a very young age, but I would say my focus was certainly as far as moving my body outdoors was certainly geared towards team sports. And so I started playing, you know, sports at a pretty young age. I think I started playing baseball, baseball at the age of six, uh, and then eventually football. And I played collegiate level football until I was, I think, 22 years old. And so that really occupied a lot of my energy of, of being outside, moving my body training. When I was 15, I did have a very formative trip to the Pacific Northwest. My folks, uh, my folks sent me out there for most of the summer to be part of a program called Global Works, and uh, similar to like a Knowles or Outward Bound structure, where we would go play outside. We went climbing, sea kayaking in the San Juans, uh, played in Olympic National Forest, went on multi-week uh, backpacking trips. But every every time we'd come back from one of those segmented outdoor experiences, we would volunteer and do some community service in and around that natural environment that we just had the opportunity to play in. And I thought that was pretty neat. And that was at the age of 15. As soon as I did that trip, I think I went to football training camp as soon as I got back and continued to really focus on, again, team sports until I graduated. Mm -hmm. When I graduated from college, whether you're a, you know, uh, D3 or D2 or D1, the average college athlete spends about 60 hours a week playing that sport, you know, combination of your game day, your, your training, your practice, watching film, reviewing plays, all that preparation adds up to about 60 hours a week in season. And when I graduated, all of a sudden I had this 60 hour week void that I really didn't know what to do. And I immediately went back to what I knew to be a powerful experience for me. And that was the outdoors. And so it started with hiking. It started with uh, climbing with some of the local mountain clubs and uh, started with volunteering. And so things just snowballed from there. I spent every waking moment I possibly had uh, in the outdoors learning about uh, learning about ways to build my own mountain craft, my outdoor skill set. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, a while ago at this point. So and, and so you mentioned you went out to the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. Where were you coming from? Did you grow up in the Midwest, the East Coast? What, what, what's your what's your childhood look like? Yeah, right. I, I was I was born and, and raised in Massachusetts. And so okay. I was born in the city and then uh, we moved out to the to the suburbs, lived in the towns of Acton and Pepperell. And um, yeah, a phenomenal suburban upbringing where I had access to, you know, the Boston city, but also the mountains of, of Western Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. And so I spent a lot of, uh, a lot of my free time in the outdoors, you know, whether it be with my parents or some of these other programs, 
just climbing the local peaks. You know, Mount Monadnock was uh, was the local the local mountain near near my house, and so spent a lot of time up there, both in my youth and as an adult. What what captured your heart, your emotion to the Pacific Northwest? And I ask that because I used to live there. And that was my first real experience in mountains. And it blew me away. Yeah. Anyone who's been there or spent significant time knows the power of, of the Cascades and the Pacific Northwest. I would say because of the timing, you know, being 15 years old, it's a pretty mm-hmm. formative time for anybody of that age. Um, kind of switching gears between childhood and adulthood. Uh, I just had incredibly fond memories of, of being out there with this other group of teenagers. And I think the young, I think the youngest was, was 15 and the oldest was 18. And it was just a, a powerful experience being in a new place in new terrain. You know, I'd never really spent any time out there, uh, kayaking around the San Juan islands. It's pretty powerful stuff. And, yep, uh, yep. you know, we're, I, we never climbed it on that trip, but you see Mount Rainier and, and, uh, and Mount Baker and Mount Adams, you know, in the distance. And they just, they're powerful peaks, they're powerful uh, mountains. And so I think I just had this incredibly fond experience out there. And when I graduated from college, I was just, I tapped into those, I tapped into that summer and it, and it certainly compelled me to continue to, to go outside. Did you have aspirations as a young kid in college to go pro in football, baseball, anything like that? I did. I, uh, you know, it, uh, I guess I never had the long-term dream of, of being a pro, but I, I certainly wanted to be as good as I could be. Mm-hmm. And I know when I graduated college, I had some opportunities to play arena football, you know, at a lower level, professional level. But I, at that time, had decided that I wanted to, to kind of move on and, and, and pursue some things on a, on a career scale. I didn't think football was going to be the end all be all. In fact, I knew at that point, you know, as a senior in college, that it, that it wouldn't be. I knew I could potentially have a few more years uh, playing, but I think I was ready to to move on and figure out what my career was going to be. Yeah, yeah. So I love that. And you mentioned team sports got you out and moving, body movement. And I feel that whenever I'm on a mountain or on a on a crag, a cliff somewhere, climbing rock or ice, whatever it may be, there's this beautiful connection between like mind and body. Uh, emotions and physicality uh, that that is really I, I think it's it's quite unreal. And so you moved from team sports into kind of this this realm where you could feel maybe the same uh, emotional physical connection, but but it was in the outdoors. H- how did that happen? How did you come to that conclusion that that was kind of a path you wanted to go down? <laughs> Brad, I just I just thought out whatever else I knew that I thought could be sustainable in the long term, You know, I knew for me, for the most part, uh, team sports at a competitive level were probably at an end. Uh, and I knew I needed to find something that would be sustainable for the, for the rest of my life. And I went to something that I had some familiarity with. And I remember driving, I was, I was driving around a motorcycle at the time living in Boston. And I remember driving it out to Mount Monadnock. And it started off just, just hiking. You know, I'd been up this peak a bunch. My dad used to take me up this thing. Um, and I just started, just started hiking it. And then I started running it. Um, and then I decided, you know, there's, there's so much more for me to learn. I, I had a great experience tapping into some of these outdoor skills, but there's a lot more out there for me to, to figure out. And um, I just knew that, you know, to your point about moving your body, I knew the outdoors was going to be my new, my new playing field. And I had a lot of energy that was uh, that needed to be spent somewhere, and so it, it just started with with the trails and local peaks I was familiar with, and then I started immediately branching out, uh, building up my skill set in, in other outdoor pursuits. Nice, nice. Now, one thing I and this goes back to to you as a person and and who you are, and and where your heart is. I believe you started working and guiding and teaching adults that were physically compromised. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. I, um, I, again, at, at a time once where we have all this extra free time, right. Um, I, I knew I wanted to immerse myself in the outdoor world. I knew that I had some energy to expend in volunteerism and I was looking to 
grow my community in the outdoor world. So I had, I had a great community in, in, in sports. I had a great, you know, college, uh, friend group, but, uh, as far as, as far as a network of people to connect with my outdoor, my outdoor community was relatively small at that point. And so I thought this would be a great way to connect with people. Um, give some of my own uh, efforts into volunteering in, in, in my local area. And so I, I found this, uh, I found this organization called Outdoor Explorations, which is now called Waypoint uh, Adventures. And, and you nailed it. It is an organization in the greater Boston area that uh, provides outdoor experiences to adults with developmental disabilities. And so we did anything from hiking to kayaking, to sailing, to climbing. And, um, you know, my early role there was learning to facilitate these experiences and learn to connect with, with people on these trips. And, if, and certainly there's a component of guiding where you're facilitating the outdoor experience, whether it be simply leading the hike, planning a trip or hanging top ropes at the local crag, you know, just outside the city there. And, and then you moved to Colorado. You're now a mountain guide, a climbing instructor. Uh, but you're also kind of a badass trail runner. And, and, and I laugh as you're talking about like, I had all this free time, you know, I'd been so busy through my adolescent years into college years. Cause you, you were in these team sports, you were, you were juggling, uh, if I can assume so you were juggling, uh, scholastics, academia, plus this, this passion and time commitment to team sports. And I, and I, I, truly do laugh that that you were like suddenly like wow i have i have all this free time and that makes me uh makes me try to wonder what's going on inside your head because he, here's why i want to go into you do these outrageous adventures in really short amounts of time and you're a co-host on this series with outside tv beat monday now I may botch this, but let me try to explain this to our audience. You and your partner essentially leave at 5 p.m. Friday and return before 8 a.m. Monday. Uh, so it's just a weekend. It is just a weekend adventure. But my God, you fly halfway around the world. You, you, know, you circumnavigate mountains and, and all these things. And so I go back to this. Well, that really must have been an imprint in you that I suddenly have all this free time and, and you, I, I just love this. And at some point I want to talk about the intensity you must have, even though on the surface, you're really calm. <laughs> and so, so tell me a little more about Beat Monday and, and a little bit more about why did you even start to think you could do really big adventures in really short amounts of time. Yeah, Brad, the whole project started. I, I actually remember the, the moment uh, very vividly. I was in a conference room at the Battery Building in downtown Denver. And the Battery Building was where I was working for a while. I worked for a company called Society, and it was a, an online startup geared towards outdoor community. Uh, but it's a startup. You're spending a lot of time working. And... Uh, my good friend, Mike Chambers, who also went to the same college that I did in upstate New York, St. Lawrence, uh, he'd recently graduated, uh, or a few years prior, he's about three, or three, four years younger than I am. Right. And he too had a similar experience where he went from kind of his college lifestyle to his, his, his post-college and, and also sought the outdoors as a, as an important place to invest his mental and physical energy. And so the two of us have become closer over the last few years. And we'd kind of call each other regularly just to see what was going on. He was living in Boston still. At this point, I'd, I'd moved to Denver. And he was also running a startup uh, that was also very time consuming. And so Mike and I would have these check-ins, you know, once a month. Hey, what do you have? What do you have on the calendar? What kind of what kind of outdoor adventures are you scheming up? And the two of us just kind of found this theme of always wanting to have something on the calendar, and always having something to work towards. But we hadn't really done much together since I'd moved away. And we just said, hey, what, you know, we're both really busy right now. And busy, I know, is a relative term, but we're both pretty tied to a, to a nine to five routine, more or less. Monday through Friday is, is pretty tied up for both of us. But we'd really like to do some things that are maybe, maybe a little bit beyond our own backyards and, and together. And we're both, you know, separated by about a five hour flight. 
So how can we make these things happen? And it just started as a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet was a list of adventures that he and I both thought we could probably pull off in a true weekend. So as you mentioned before, a true weekend being when that clock hits five o'clock on Friday and when it strikes again, nine o'clock Monday morning, you've got this 64 hour window of, of time to, to do a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And so this list involved, this, we still have this list to this day. It's just a Google spreadsheet. But one of the, one of the main, the main formula that goes into that is that ideally it's something that neither of us have done before. It's a new experience, something that involves something new to us. You know, it doesn't just have to be physically stressful or challenging. Uh, it doesn't have to, it doesn't always have to be a suffer fest, so to speak, but something new and exciting to both of us. And then sure. Yeah. We'd like to challenge ourselves both mentally and physically in the outdoors. And for us, neither of us at the time, believe it or not, had climbed Mount Rainier. And so we decided, Hey, this is perfect. You know, it's a little closer to Denver. It's quite a ways from Boston, but let's see if we can climb and ski Mount Rainier in a, in a proper weekend. So we show up, I won't tell you the whole story, but we show up, they, <laughs> the Rangers over there do a phenomenal job by the way. Um, but they are, they do their job very well. And it took us probably an hour and a half of convincing for them to issue us a permit, uh, yeah. for both of our first time on the mountain, both of our first attempt to ski it and having, you know, never been there before. Uh, they finally let us have a permit. Mike and I climbed and skied the, the Evans glacier. Mm-hmm. It, it was executed perfectly. We had great weather, which I know for many Rainier folks out there, that is often a rarity. Uh, and it went great. And, uh, men's journal wrote up an article about it. And, uh, it, it, it was, it was a nice little article just talked about what you can do in a weekend. And then this company at a bend, Oregon named, uh, Delve media saw some promise in the beat Monday project as a way of storytelling via a TV series or web series. And so that was back in 2016. And I'll, I'll save you the, I'll save you the long winded story, or at least I'll make a, a longer story slightly shorter. Uh, we've partnered up with Delve Media and we have created uh, a TV show and a series of shorts. And so we've, we've originally created three episodes. Then we did five shorts. So like about five minute uh, quick webisodes. Mm-hmm. And then now we're in the middle of filming six more full length episodes with our, our other partner outside TV. Nice. Nice. So over these seasons of filming this, what, uh, yeah, is there any, is there any one weekend that sticks out? <laughs> they're every, they're all very memorable. Um, I'd say probably the first one we ever filmed was a big adjustment for me because uh, working in guiding, you know, I like to plan. Uh, I'm pretty meticulous with my timing. I like to account for, you know, what I think our pace can be, if Mike and I can sustain it. I think I'm pretty good at that. And I like to plan. I like to have my logistics really in order. But what I found out was, and, and, and I'll explain the whole thing. We, we went to go climb and ski Mount Hood and then circumnavigated on foot in a day. So nothing totally crazy, but it's a, it's a hard effort. And no, no, wait, 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 nothing totally crazy to define, uh, elevation gain and loss on hood. And then, and then mileage of circumnavigating this, this little oh boy. East of the mountain near Portland. Don't, don't quote me on my numbers. The reason I say nothing crazy is you got to be careful with the Pacific Northwesterners because whenever somebody from Colorado goes out there, yeah. I like to just say hey, it's their backyard. It's probably been done a hundred times before, just it's never been documented by anyone over there. So, um, that's my, that's my saving grace statement. Um, no, it's a bit, it's a big outing, uh, the climb and ski <laughs> Mount hood, man, I forget what the starting trail at elevation is. It's a few thousand feet to the summit. Um, so you started at Timberline, you started uh, at Timberline. Yeah. Yep. Went, went up the stand. Which, route. And Timberline is, is the, it's the parking lot. It's where people start. Uh, it's not literally like tree line. It's just Timberline. That's the name of the lodge. That's the name of where people start. So you went from Timberline up to the summit. Do you go through the hogs back and that whole, you, so you did the standard route or did you do another route? No, we did, we did the standard route. It was, yeah. uh, it was pretty late season. And that's part of the, my learning that the perfect conditions in a guiding or climbing mindset often you've got to make some compromises with a production mindset. So just mm-hmm. timing for everybody. You're often, you're making choices when it comes, whether it's risk management or 
less I less than ideal conditions, but it's not a great time to ski hood in July. So no, no, there's not much snow on the lower slopes. No, I mean <laughs> we could we had we we were able to ski. To, uh, we didn't actually ski from the summit because it was so so firm and sun cupped. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We ended up kind of booting off the summit back kind of below, just above the hog's back. Um, you hit the both, both of the worst circumstances because it's yes. that time of year. You hit the icy top yeah. and then no snow at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah. okay, so you, you do this and then how many miles around to circumnavigate that mountain? I think it ends up being like about 40 miles um, mm -hmm. to run the classic Timberline Trail. And so, and, and then you all fly back and you're back at work for 8 a.m. on Monday. We, yeah, exactly. And <laughs> the, the reason it's memorable is a, it was a really fun trip. It was mm. my first time, uh, up Mount hood. It was my first time running the Timberland trail. Um, but one thing that I, that I did learn is you just need to factor in more time for filming and more time for production prep. You know, I think Mike and I landed in, in Portland pretty early, early enough that we could have actually gone to bed and gotten some sleep. But because there were things to do from a production standpoint, uh, there were SD cards to be mm -hmm. uploaded and batteries to be charged and additional logistics to be planned. Uh, we did some you know, behind the scenes filming and Mike and I didn't sleep that night. And so it just made this adventure extra challenging. And so I remember being at the end of this thing thinking, man, this was a little harder than I kind of thought it was going to be. I, I feel pretty beat. And uh, remembering that we, I hadn't slept since, you know, a whole day prior. So it yeah. was just uh, one of those things you learn when you start documenting and storytelling at a higher level. It's uh, yeah, you, you make some sacrifices. What, but I believe, and maybe I'm wrong here, but I believe some of your adventures on beat Monday are not just domestic here in the U S yeah, I, I think you've flown international, done some things and flown back all on a weekend. Is there anything uh, worth mentioning there? Yeah, Brad, you nailed it. I mean, part of the Beat Monday, uh, part of the reason we started it was, A, to, 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 to have some fun ourselves. But as it's grown into a platform where we can share these adventures, mm -hmm. one thing that's important to Mike and I is to inspire other people to do their own Beat Monday adventures and to, and, and to also make them often either, either doable if they can translate that into their own abilities, but then also relatable in other senses. And so mm -hmm. certainly some of these international ones, which I'll mention are not as relatable, right? That's, that's more expensive for some folks that are going to fly mm -hmm. for just a few days. Um, you may not have the skill set to do some of these international objectives on your own without assistance, but the point is to take that and put it in your own perspective. You know, if Jason and Mike can, can go to this place, then, then maybe that that trip that's just a two hour drive from my house is really something that's more attainable. And so that's kind of the view there. And there's also the the challenge factor. You know, when you incorporate international travel into any adventure, as you know well yourself, Brad, a lot can go wrong. Whether it be a missed flight, lost baggage, um, changes in currency, changes in language, things can happen and make things much more difficult. And we know that. And so intentionally, we've chosen a, a few objectives that we know will present some more interesting content for lack of our success rate. Um, so we actually did, we flew down to Ecuador uh, in, a, in a true weekend and uh, went down to go climb Cotopaxi. And uh, it was a, it was a phenomenal experience. I think they tell us that uh, they have 50 days a year where there's no summits. And we happen to be on one of those 50 days a year. <laughs> so we, we got up there, we're ready to charge. You know, the refugio up there is at 16.5. And so coming from Colorado, we are certainly at an advantage from someone coming from sea level, but mm -hmm. you still feel the altitude when you're, when you're hiking up to the refugio. And then we tried to leave the hut a few times, but weather just never allowed us to, to go far at all. And so we spent a night in the, in the hut up there and uh, eventually figured out we'd, we'd run out of time, you know, yeah. which is really not something that's an option when, you're, when you have these weekend missions and, and we headed out. The, the nice thing is we got, we basically had a whole extra day of exploring the countryside. And so we got to visit with some, some local folks, spent some time in the local markets. And so it ended up not being the biggest endurance adventure of, uh, of the Beat Monday, uh, tar, you know, Beat Monday outings we've had, but it ended up being a pretty, pretty cool 
cultural experience for me being my first time in Ecuador. It's funny you mentioned, you know, it was one of the 50 days that, that people don't see summits on that mountain. And I, I often question myself the importance of reaching the summit versus the experience of the journey. And, and I think they're both valuable. They're, they're, they're just not necessarily equally important or, or mutually combined. And so it brings me back to a story. My wife in 2013, Tanya was on Makalu. It's fifth highest mountain in the world. She stood to be, I believe, the second American woman to reach the top if she had reached the top. And uh, she got within like 400 feet of the top and, and turned around and made, made all the right decisions. But she came back home really bummed out that she had not reached the summit. And it's funny what, what friends can tell her versus what a husband can tell her. I, I just let it sit. <laughs> and, and let her let her you know realize that disappointment if i had mentioned anything or tried to coach her through you know maybe it wouldn't have played out in the same regards as what one of our friends said and i don't know if you know chris morris he and i were great friends in alaska he was a longtime guide well he took eric weimeyer up to the top mm -hmm. of everest uh, yeah. and and chris at the time looked at her one day because she was she she had had such tremendous success every time she went to a big mountain she reached the top and she didn't this time and it was eating at her and i remember chris he looked at her and he told her he's like tanya you didn't make it to the top she's like no he said now you're a mountaineer <laughs> and i just love that i love that and so that you guys had this great experience wonderful experience, but you didn't make it to the top. And, and I think that's, that's a beautiful part of this calculation of where do we fit in and what are our journeys? And, and I love that. And so as a mountain guide, when you take people on these trips, whether it's a local rock climb or a larger, more long-term adventure, how do you feel on these trips? What do you see as valuable on these trips? Uh, in a, in a, from a guiding perspective? Yeah. That's tricky. That's, uh, as you know, that's a, uh, you certainly want to do everything you can to provide, first and foremost, a great experience. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, let me take that back. First and foremost, as safe as, a, as an experience as you can possibly have. <laughs> right, add. right. Yeah. Yeah, you might have to do a little editing there, Brad. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Second, second would be facilitate a great experience. And that's where the definition is a little subjective, right? Because there's the old adage, you know, there's the three rules of mountaineering, right? You, number one is you, you come back alive. Number two, you come back as friends. And number three, you get to the top. And so from a guiding profession, it's, it's very similar. It's like, number one, you keep things as safe as possible, mitigate all the risks you can. Number two, facilitate the best possible experience you, you can. Sometimes, certainly, achieving the objective adds to a higher client client reward, right? For the mm -hmm. most part, that's why a lot of people sign up for those experiences. But, and of course, number three is, is, is right. Get to the top. Um, but for me, that number two, one of really facilitating a great experience is, is the most important part. So I'm doing everything I can to yeah. do a good job beforehand. So a lot of times it comes down to communication with people, mm -hmm. um, setting, setting objectives, setting goals, setting boundaries, and then doing what I can to keep the pace going as far as achieving the objective. But along the way, you're facilitating uh, relationship building. You're teaching people skills. Mm -hmm. You're showing them things. And so in addition to or aside from, you know, metaphorically getting to the top or literally sometimes, uh, you're just trying to show someone the best possible mem memorable day you can have. Um, and so I certainly think of that. It depends on who the client is and what the outing is. Sometimes the summit is more important than others to the individual, but it's my job just in general to show them, show them a good time and, and communicate those experiences early and, or communicate the, communicate kind of where we're at with the day, whether it's happening or not, uh, as often and, uh, and, 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 as and, as and often in, in my experience, it's within the hour. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes hurting cats and sometimes not so much. Yep. And, uh, and, I, and I've learned the hard way, you know, early on in my guiding career, I, you know, you just, you just, it, 
guiding in North America is very customer service based. And I think that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know for me, I'm just, I was a little bit too nice. I don't think I clearly defined the expectations of the day and we did have to turn around and, and, it, and early on in my career, it, it certainly led to some, some up, not so happy folks. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that happens, but what do you enjoy about the days you're out guiding? For, for me, you know, when I'm with someone, whether it be a, a, a climbing partner uh, who's, who's not paying me or a mm-hmm. client, it's, it's really the same. Uh, for me in the outdoors, although I've done many things solo, I really enjoy the partnership mm-hmm. and I enjoy having a new experience. And so whether it's doing those things with my own personal recreational partners or with my clients is exactly the same. I want to show them a bond that's been created either with with other clients that are there together and ideally as us as an entire climbing team. So that that memory of a partner is really important to me. The other one is just building your skill set in a new place. And so whether it's someone going rock climbing for the first time or they've been working with me for years to hone their mountain craft as an alpinist, seeing them build those skills and then apply them in real time in the mountains is is an incredible experience. And so those are pretty much the two things that I'm always looking for is an application of your skills in the mountains to take you to new places and that memory of, of a climbing partner. So as you're going through these adventures, whether it's trail running, whether it is guiding, whether it's filming an episode of beat Monday and you're moving, you're moving full steam ahead. Do you ever have time? And and do you ever take the time to like, notice the stars at night or a wind across your face or, or how cold your fingers are, which, which like they're, they're these very visceral feelings we can feel in mother nature. Do you, do you allow yourself those moments? I do. It's, it's funny you bring that up, Brad, because in, uh, in one of the episodes we filmed, I can't, I don't think it ever made it in, into the, uh, the final beat Monday cut, but we did, did the picnic in Jackson hole. And so picnic in Jackson hole is you bike from downtown Jackson uh, about 24 miles into Grand Teton National Park. You swim about a mile and a half across Jenny Lake, and then you climb and summit the Grand Teton, and then you do it all in reverse. So yeah, big so an day. Easy, an easy day. An easy day out, <laughs> out in the woods. Yeah, okay. Again, got to be careful. I think the, the local... <laughs> oh, I know. I know. There are always local badasses out there. That- oh, yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 it's happened on multiple occasions in Jackson, and I don't know if they can just tell that I'm a tourist and I'm not local out there but um on multiple occasions we're running down the switch paths down from the grand trying to get back to loop meadows and on both on two different trips i've had people yell out to me like hey stop and smell the roses and i i i really believe this as a, you know i've been playing outside for a long time and hopefully mm-hmm. older wisdom allows you to see things but i still think that i've seen way more roses than a lot of these other other folks I think there are two different ways to explore the outdoors. It's apples and oranges, but I do feel like the experience you have moving quickly through the mountains allows you to almost be more in tune with some of the, some of the terrain you're, you're moving in and some of the, some of your senses almost feel heightened. Certainly some of them are probably a little bit dumbed down. Maybe your sense of smell cause it's, it's full of snot from running up and down the mountains all day. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I truly feel like, you end up being very in tune and you end up just seeing a lot of terrain kind of come at you from all different angles. And so I don't, maybe I'll have a different answer for you in, in 10 years, but I, I feel like they're just two different experiences and yeah. not one is better than the other. And I don't think, I, I think when you're moving quickly, in some ways you see more about a mountain experience. And then when you're moving slowly and just taking your time, so to speak, you see more in other ways. And so I think they're just, unfortunately, not comparable. Yeah, totally understandable. Now, I also want to ask you about being a dad. And <laughs> you're a father. Uh, I've, I've seen, oh, I just saw today on Facebook, you were towing your daughter through the snow. Colorado, to, for our audience, Colorado just got a dump of snow. And and you were just skiing through the neighborhood, towing your daughter. Uh <laughs> But I've also seen you take her ice climbing, rock climbing. You guys went deep into Rocky Mountain National Park at some point. And she's tiny. She's a little girl. How old is she? So I, we have two little girls now. Uh, okay. The one you're referring to is Avery, and she's four years old. Four years and, old. 
Yep. And our youngest is Andorra, or we call her Andy, and she just turned one last week. How, you know, being a, being a father, does that change your perspective on risk or does it, does it motivate you more to introduce your children into the outdoors? That's a great question, Brad. Before I answer this, I'll also note that video you're referring to, if you look closely, you'll see my wife, who's 10 times the badass I am, towing <laughs> our youngest and a bunch of uh, firewood for uh, a friend who lives down the street in that. <laughs> right, right. So you just had to <laughs> but my, my, uh, I was just blocking the view of the, of the real badass in the frame. But yeah, um, yeah. as far as risk is concerned, I do have those moments. I, but I feel like I fully don't have a great grasp on my... my I, I, I feel like I'm pretty risk averse in the grand scheme of mountain people. Um, that being said, uh, I certainly take more risks than some and less than others. Uh, I do remember when Avery was first born, I feel like I had a much higher tolerance for risk. I was doing a lot more ropeless climbing for maybe mm -hmm. the first six to eight months of her life. And I don't really, I don't really know why to this day. I, it was just something I gravitated towards. And then as she got a little bit older and started to develop more of a personality, I feel like I am much more aware and a little bit more methodical about what I choose to do. I do remember my first big trip to Alaska. Avery was eight months old. And I remember kind of turning the corner on a route and it was like time to commit moment. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I want to do this. I'm ready for it. But I, I felt like I was kind of making a committing move by, by starting up the route. Yeah. Uh, and I remember having that internal conversation with myself. Yeah. So how do you, do you feel like it would be cool to introduce your daughters to the outdoors or do you want to let them find that on their own accord? Where does that fall into being a, being a dad? Yeah. As you, as you've mentioned, um, we, we've, we've exposed them to the outdoors quite a bit. I think, I think Avery <laughs> slept in a tent, uh, 50 nights, her first year of life, um, yeah. which, you know, isn't as much as some of those, those folks that are always on the road, but it's, it's pretty good for a family of four living in golden. Um, so yeah, we're outside a lot. We take her climbing a lot. We take her skiing. Uh, I like to expose her to things that I think that she thinks will be fun. Uh, and if she's not into it, I, I try to pull the plug as quick as possible. You know, for me, I think long term, we just want to give her options and expose her to different things and let her pick what's yeah. what she's she finds enjoyable, whether that be, you know, for me, sure, I I was in the outdoors a little bit growing up, you know, I went hiking with my dad, biking with my dad, uh, my mom would take me to the climbing gym every once in a while, just to see what it's like, but they directed me towards team sports. And that's ended up where I spent 90% yeah. of my energy. Uh, and the same could be true for Avery and Andorra, we, we would like to have them be part of of our life, Jenny and I, um, my wife and I, because I, I think it's very admirable to fully commit yourself um, to your kids. Uh, but I also think it's important to continue to have your own goals and aspirations, even you know, over the age of 30 or 40, depending on who you, or 50 or 60 or 70, depending on, uh, on where you are and where you live, there's different pressures there. And so I do think it's important in this stage of my life to continue to have my own goals, desires, and ambitions in, in addition to supporting those of my kids. And that can be a, a different challenge as well. So. So speaking of your own goals and ambitions, what, what would you want to do if you could do anything? Oh boy. Oh man. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's a tricky question. Brad. <laughs> but I know you've thought about it. I have. Um, I would say for me, it's, it's, it's less of a one-off one -off thing. There's certainly a few objectives in the mountains that I think would be fun to, to take on. And I, again, plan on, plan on uh, continuing to grow that list of goals. But I think for me, one of the biggest things that I've done in, in recent years, and believe it or not, it might sound contradictory to your introduction of, of me, but it's just really committing to an outdoor lifestyle in the long haul. Um, you know, I've kind of committed even more to guiding in the last three years because I want yeah. to play a, a bigger role mm -hmm. uh, professionally for me. And, and as far as a long term energy and passion in that, um, I think it's important to me to always just have something that's inspiring in the outdoors and just to keep keep moving. 
You know, I keep moving through the mountains at whatever speed I'm capable of, whether it's uh, at a high rate of speed doing fun things now, or just being outside for a few hours when I'm an, an old man. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Hey, where, where can people find out more about, you know, whether it's, it's you guiding or you training or, or again, this beat Monday program, where can people find out more about you? Oh boy. Well, Brad, I guess I'll give you my, my elevator pitch. Cause you, you kind of started off the interview here, the, our, our conversation here with the same look that uh, a lot of people have when they try to introduce me to somebody else. And it's like, what actually do you do? You do? Oh, um, oh, you're, you're singing to the choir here, by the yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. it, 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 over years, as, as I've become more confident in my ability to connect with people in this space, it, I usually describe to people that I like to help people get outside. And that's through mm-hmm. three major ways. Number one is training themselves physically and mentally to, to prepare themselves for the rigors of the mountains. And I do that in, in kind of two major ways. The, the, the primary one is as a coach at the Alpine Training Center in Boulder, Colorado. And I also just started coaching folks remotely through Uphill Athlete. So if you're okay. familiar with, with those folks, those are two ways that I typically connect with people to primarily strengthen their body, but also their minds and get them ready for the mountains. The second one is to physically give them the skills and or be out there with them, leading them in the mountains as a guide. Mm-hmm. And the last one is through storytelling. And so the three major ways you can get a hold of me are, like I said, the Alpine Training Center or Uphill Athlete for some coaching. Uh, number two is going to be through guiding. I, I work full time right now for the Colorado Mountain School. Yep. And so a great way to get outside with me is to, to reach out to me directly. Um, often I get a lot of folks through social media on Instagram, which is at Jason Anton, just my name. Um, come outside. If you're looking to achieve a, a goal in the future, I'd love to work with you in any capacity to give you the skills to do it on your own or uh, be part, be your climbing partner for that experience. And the last one is, as you know, Brad, storytelling. Um, one of the major ways I do that is through the Beat Monday project. And that can be seen on outside television. We filmed one full length episode or one early season or one season to kick things off. We did five shorts and we're in the middle of filming six more full length episodes. Right. In fact, I just got back from Hawaii uh, last weekend for our third of six episodes. And it's going to be a good one. So stay nice. tuned. Nice. Oh, uh, well, Jason, it's always a pleasure. Uh, can't thank you enough. This, you know, look forward to meeting in person again once uh, once pandemic circumstances allow uh, for, for fun get togethers. But it's always an absolute pleasure to just talk and, and hang out. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, Brad, thanks for the invite to, to have a conversation with you. It's been a great uh, way to keep my day going. Cool, man. Catch you later. See ya. All right. See ya.